But again, it's because of the times have changed. Times have changed, threats have changed, but they're changing again, and that's kind of the theme of what we'll talk about today. So whilst back in the day, Nora was able to keep it in the sky, airplanes 24-7, 365, always ready for the real possibility the Cold War could turn into World War III at a moment's notice. It was a time when our national security wasn't taken for granted. Our children literally practiced taking cover under their desks at school, and the citizens built bomb shelters in their backyards. The Soviet threat was real, they had capability, they had capacity, and they had intent to hold us, the United States and Canada, at risk. In the end, we won the Cold War, and through it all, the Canadians and Americans at NORAD lived out their motto, we have the watch. That motto carries on today, and just as they said it at the beginning of NORAD 60 years ago, our team takes great pride in having that watch. When I look at the security environment of today, I see striking parallels between our past and our present from yesterday to today. And both Canada's strong, secure, engaged defense policy and the United States national security strategy and the national defense strategy are very clear. We face a more competitive and dangerous international security environment today than we have in generations. And like yesterday, our security environment is marked by the reemergence of great power competition with an evolving balance of power the changing nature of conflict and the rapid evolution and proliferation of technology. Our competitors are analyzing our capabilities, investigating our perceived vulnerabilities, and methodically developing capabilities to erode our competitive military advantage. And like yesterday, they seek to threaten our nations to undercut the position of strength on which our diplomats depend and put at risk our ability to project power. Some of the behavior we grew accustomed to yesterday is happening again today. Our nations no longer enjoy a sanctuary, and our adversaries clearly intend to hold us at risk. And as was recently reported in the Canadian press, Russian media reported last month that Russia's military resumed fighter patrols to the North Pole for the first time in 30 years. These patrols will be in addition to the regular bomber flights up to the edge of U.S. and Canadian airspace. And not unlike what we saw just three weeks ago, Russia flew its nuclear-capable heavy bombers inside the Canadian Air Defense Identification Zone without any advance notice. They recently began deploying surface vessels in their Arctic territorial waters, armed with modular caliber cruise missiles that offer very precise capabilities. They introduced new cruise missile threat, exploiting the perceived weaknesses of Canada and the United States from our northern approach. And just a couple weeks ago, they announced quite publicly that they're fielding hypersonic live vehicles capable of nuclear and conventional payloads and subsurface nuclear power torpedoes that can strike our ships and ports. All of these and other actions demonstrate with little doubt that we are at risk in ways we haven't been in decades. And while we have many initiatives in place to begin the military advantage and maintain that military advantage that we've had for so long, we must ask if our current efforts are enough in today's changing environment. And I'll repeat that again. We must ask if our current efforts are enough in today's changing security environments. And we haven't seen this sort of systematic and methodical increase in threat since the height of the Cold War. We must acknowledge the reality that our adversaries currently hold our citizens, our way of life, and national interests at risk. And rather than simply responding to advancements in doctrine and technology, we must drive ahead of those strategies and create dilemmas to make it too possible for any nation to contemplate an attack on our nations. And simply put, the security environment has fundamentally changed, which introduces some important questions for both the United States and Canada. For instance, what are we doing to defend our nations? What's NORAD's role in addressing these threats within both Canada and the United States? And in this age of great competition for resources, how will each nation respond to these threats? Let there be no doubt, these are tough questions, but we have, to, we have to ask them, and we have to get after them, and we have to have answers for them. And like we did in the past, we have to identify that threat, understand how our citizens view that threat, respond to the threat, and ultimately defend against that threat. So let's look at what we're doing in NORAD. We're looking at these threats and what we do about them in ways that is causing us to rethink about our defense. It's our sacred obligation to do this, and for years we've 
operate with the assumption that North America is a sanctuary, protected geographically by the Arctic to the north and oceans to our east and oceans to our west and friendly neighbors to our south. Today, we know that North America is not a sanctuary. As such, we're rethinking how we need to protect our nations and we're challenging our assumptions and developing initiatives to get after it. Let me give you an example of the kind of challenges we face so that we'll be able to detect and track threats and defeat attacks when necessary. And to this end, NORAD has a series of radars in northern Canada to detect those airborne threats. But that North Warning system still uses 1980s, about 1985 to be specific, if I think we have someone here that was just working there a couple years ago. Technology, is that adequate in today's environment? Is the construct of using terrestrial radars insufficient against the kinds of emerging threats we face? Should we be looking at space-based surveillance? Should it be a combination thereof? These are the kinds of questions that we have to ask and we have to answer and we ultimately have to resource. And by rethinking how we think about the defense of our nations, we're also widening our view that, of what we need to defend against. For example, our competitors have successfully threatened North America with new military doctrine and highlighting the importance of non-nuclear deterrence, <coughs> including the use of cyber, incorporating our critical infrastructure into their target set, and using economic warfare as part of their strategy. Our roads, ports, dams, pipelines, power grids, airports, communication <coughs> networks, and cyber systems are increasingly viewed as targets. In the, comp in the, comp in the competition space below the level of armed conflict, we see our critical infrastructure already being targeted, which is a vulnerability both Canada and the United States share. Our power grids are an example of this shared vulnerability, and it's instructive to look at a map of how the power grids lay across North America. The entire northeast part of the United States, from York to Maine, share the same power grid as the province of Quebec. And similarly, Manitoba and Saskatchewan share the same power grid of the U.S.'s upper mid Midwest, all the way through Nebraska and Iowa. And the Western interconnection, which stretches from the U.S.-Mexico border in New Mexico, Arizona and California, stretches all the way to Alberta and British Columbia. It's the largest in North America. And the hardening and protection of our shared critical infrastructure must be part and parcel with any North American defense initiative we undertake. So we're looking hard at the best ways we can defend this critical infrastructure and much of this relies on the partnerships we have, not only within our militaries, but within our interagency and industry. And if you look into the future, we're looking at multi-domain layered sensing grid architecture to ensure we have the absolute best systems and situational awareness across all domains, not just the air domain. We're also pursuing the ability to integrate our nation's defense globally and pursue the ability to analyze the distinctions between national defense, national security, military intelligence, and law enforcement provide response app options at the speed of relevance. In rethinking how we think, we're taking every opportunity to ensure our nation's defense is driven into policy, strategic strategy and doctrine, and we advocate for this way of thinking with all that we interact with. We must continue to build upon all the great things that we're currently doing while looking for further opportunities. For example, the exercise that the U.S. and Canada conduct on a regular routine basis are critically important whether in the Arctic or, to, for example, in Alaska at our J-Park range, they're critically important that we interoperate together and we do so in the harsh environments that we might be faced and asked to operate in. In our Operation Noble Eagle Intercepts, the bread and butter of NORAD, are extremely successful, but we're re rethinking what it means to defend against nation state threats and responding to the changes in tactics that we experience as our competitors attempt to find new ways to hold our nations at risk. We're also looking hard at force posture. We're conducting a northern basin study to ensure we have the right forces and facilities where we need them. We have taken initiatives to make sure that we can get after this to respond to this security environment that we find changing so rapidly. And thankfully, we're doing all this together and we have a history of success. There are no two stronger allies than the United States and Canada. And when it comes to the mutual defense of our citizens, there's no one that's been doing it as long as we have in the collaborative nature of which we're doing it today. And the six decades of NORAD's unmatched experience and shared history are proving more vital than ever as we face the most complex security environment in generations. 
as we did in the Cold War, we're, we will identify the threat, we'll understand how our citizens view the threat, and we'll respond to the threat and be able to defend our nations. And over the past several decades, we've been fortunate to live in a time when the average Canadian or American didn't have to worry much about threats to this to their safety from, from external threats. Our citizens felt safe from attack. They didn't have to hide under their desks. They didn't have to be directly involved in the defense of our nations and we're grateful for this freedom. However, it's our duty when the strategic threat changes to identify that threat and respond appropriately. And if you want to remember one thing from my speech today, I would ask you to remember this. Today's threats to our nations are fundamentally different than yesterday's. We now live in a security environment that is quite different, and we must respond to this threat. As Nora responds to our new security environment, we must work together to regain the strategic advantage against all of our competitors. We cannot afford to fall into the paralysis by analysis trap while our competitors are putting us at risk with credible threats. And while there's certainly a difference between what's urgent and what's important, we're sometimes prone to tackle the urgent, putting off the important. But we're clear-eyed and NORAD right now when we say that the defense of our nation is both urgent and important. And as such, we need to get after it and we need to get after it together. There is no greater partnership in the world to do this with, and I'm honored to be the commander of this bi-national command. With that, I would ask for any questions um, that I could add to try to help us understand what we can do from the NORAD perspective to ultimately defend our nations. Thank you.